we're talking about transcription. And so um, we covered uh, transcriptional basics with the last video. Um, this video is uh, meant to introduce you to the whole process of transcription. And then we're gonna move into uh, specifics about bacteria. And so if we're thinking about transcription, um, we've got DNA. Uh, the idea here is that the DNA is going to be turned into or used as a template to make RNA. And so we've got a sequence that we want to turn into RNA. There's a promoter, uh, and then there are transcription factors, uh, either uh, basal transcription factors in eukaryotes or sigma factors in bacteria that will bind to that DNA. Uh, and then uh, the the DNA will separate, uh, so it'll go from a closed, so, sorry, the binding of the transcription factors or sigma factors will bring in the RNA polymerase. And so you get recruitment of proteins to the DNA. The next step is uh, you have a closed complex. So that is we've got double-stranded DNA here. Uh, a transcription bubble is gonna form. And so we're gonna melt that, that uh, DNA. We're gonna separate the strands to make an open complex. So after we've got the open complex, we can begin transcription. Uh, this is going to go for an, uh, a, 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 well, an indetermined amount of time, but really a predetermined amount of time. Uh, it's going to go until the polymerase reaches a terminator. So it's going to elongate for either a very long time or a very short time, uh, depending on, on where the location of that terminator is. Um, but elongation is what we call it when the RNA is being made. And then after elongation, uh, there'll be a process called termination, which takes the RNA from the polymerase. Uh, it brings the DNA strands back together and it removes the RNA polymerase so that it can be recycled and this process can start again. So we can break this, all of transcription, up into three processes, whether we're considering eukaryotes or bacteria. The first process is initiation. The second process is elongation. And the third process is termination. And so for the rest of this video, we're gonna focus on initiation in bacteria. There are some uh, very specific things that we can talk about for initiation in bacteria. And then the next video in this series, we'll come back and cover elongation and termination in bacteria. And then next week, uh, I'll put up a whole separate set of videos where we'll cover eukaryotic initiation, elongation, and termination. So I'm going to highlight the first three steps. So binding of, of uh, sigma factors, transcription factors, and the RNA polymerase to the DNA, that's step one. Uh, separating of the strands, so going from closed complex to an open complex, that's step two. And then there's uh, uh, the process of initiation, which is really starting to form that transcript. We're going to talk a little bit about that as part of this video. So that's where we're headed. Hopefully I'll have some popcorn because this is gonna be <laughs> how it goes for the rest of the day. All right, so if we're thinking about transcription, the best thing to do is to start by thinking about the nucleic acids, okay? And so we've got a piece of DNA that we want to transcribe. Um, so there is uh, uh, a gene down here. We're going to use the, the gene uh, as template in order to make RNA. So we've got um, some sequence in the promoter. And so this is the region upstream that will begin that process of transcription. Remember from the last video, uh, transcription starts at the promoter and ends at the terminator. So within this bacterial promoter, we've got a couple of regions that we need to highlight. First, there's the minus 10 region here. There's the minus 35 region here. And then there's the up element or the UP element here. And so the polymerase is going to use the first 100 base pairs approximately of DNA in order to bind. And so there are uh, these three uh, sequences within the DNA that are helping to bring that polymerase in and bind. 
So um, let's talk a little bit about convention. So annotation is really what we're considering. How do we mark this DNA in order to give us some meaningful information about how this process is gonna work? We've got plus one right here. So plus one is the transcription start site. So plus one is where this region is going to begin. That's where the RNA is actually going to be made. And so minus 10 would be 10 base pairs upstream of that plus one. And so remember, if plus one is our anchor point here, the gene is going to be downstream and minus 10 will be upstream. So minus 10, we're thinking about 10 base pairs away from where transcription will actually begin. So this sequence right here, this minus 10 region, this will never be made into RNA. The main purpose or the only purpose of that uh, DNA is to bring the, the RNA polymerase in. So it's recruiting the RNA polymerase to that particular region and saying, here, this is where we want to start transcription. So the minus 10 and the minus 35 are both important in that process. Um, the, these, these two different regions have a specific sequence that's being labeled here. So T, T, G, A, C, A. T A T A A T. So there's a specific sequence that we know. And so I want to spend a minute or two thinking about exactly how we know that sequence. We'll come back to this all in a minute. So what we can do is we can take promoters, so we can get in a computer a list of all the promoters that we know that are binding to a particular, uh, uh, particular protein. So we can say all of these genes are being actively transcribed. All of these regions upstream of these genes are known promoters. And then we can take that sequence information and we can compare it. So we can use a computer to go through and look for similarities in the sequence. And so this is called a consensus sequence. So consensus means that of all the places that are activating transcription, um, this is the consensus among all of those places. And so I'm displaying that consensus information here, the consensus sequence here. So here's our minus 10, T, A, T, A, A, T. You can see that the majority of the time it's a T, Majority of the time, it's an A. The majority of the time, it's a T. The majority of the time, it's an A. We can go all the way through these. I'm not gonna belabor it, but what I want you to see is that even though the majority of the time it's a T, it's only about 75% of the time. So this doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be a T, but the majority of the time, that's what you'll see. And so what happens is, this, the, position, the, the particular code or the particular um, nitrogenous bases in this sequence are going to dictate how strongly that promoter recruits polymerase. And so what I mean by that is that the better the match is to the consensus, the better the match is to what's being displayed here, the better this thing is going to be at recruiting the, the proteins in uh, to begin transcription. So something that is uh, expressed at a really high level. Um, so, so, so what I mean by that is an RNA that has to be made a lot. Um, that's going to have a very, uh, uh, a sequence that's very close to the consensus. And something that is like a rare, uh, something that's less, made less frequently um, will not be as close to the consensus sequence. Okay, so that's, that's the main concept. We know that this T, T, G, A, C, A, T, A, T, T, or sorry, T, A, T, A, A, T. We know that this is the consensus. Uh, we know that there's usually a separation of between 15 and 19 nucleotides. It doesn't have to be this way, but the, 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 um, the, the similarity uh, will tell you something about how much expression you get or how much RNA you get from that particular promoter. So here, kind of coming back to that a little bit, we can go through and we can make changes. And so we've got a sequence right here. This is the consensus sequence. We're focused on that minus 10 and minus 35. If we have this exact consensus sequence, we, get, um, we know we get transcription from that. We can go in and we can make changes to the promoter. So we can change, uh, here we've, we've substituted AA for GT. Uh, down here we've substituted a G for a T. 
And here we've removed a nucleotide. So we've changed the distance of that spacer, right? So rather than it being however many nucleotides this is, it's one fewer. Um, so we can make changes and see what effect that has on uh, transcription. And so the way that we're measuring transcription, we're looking at transcription down here. The way that we're doing that is we're relying on the fact that that transcript is going to be turned into protein. So we're relying on the fact that the cells are going to translate the RNA into protein. In this case, we're using a protein called uh, beta-galactosidase. And so beta-galactosidase is an enzyme that we know uh, will interact with this chemical called XGAL and create a blue color. And so um, we can use the, the beta-galactosidase activity to tell us about how much transcription we're getting from a particular promoter. So the idea is that we're not actually measuring transcription directly, we're measuring protein and then production of an enzyme from the protein, but it's related to the amount of transcription that comes from that particular, uh, particular promoter. So here we've got a wild type LAC promoter. And so the LAC promoter is T, 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 A, C, A. And so you notice there's an important difference there, right? So there's uh, the wild type, the normal promoter is, is not quite at the consensus. It's not a perfect match to the consensus sequence. And then over here, we've got two deviations as well. We've got G and T. That's again, not a perfect match to that minus 10 consensus sequence. So if we look here, what you would expect, because it's not a perfect match, is that we're getting some level of beta-galactosidase activity. And then if we make mutations, so here we're removing one of the nucleotides uh, in, in the spacer, we improve the activity a little bit. So by making a change and bringing it closer to the consensus sequence, we're, we're um, improving the activity at that promoter. Here, we can change the GT into AA. We improve the activity a little bit more. And so if you look at all of these dis different conditions, the one that has the highest level of beta-galactosidase activity is mutant number three. And so this is not exactly a perfect match to the consensus sequence, but it's pretty close. Okay, so, so we've got a, a, a match that's more in line than the LAC promoter, the wild type LAC promoter. It's more in line with the consensus sequence than the, the, than the normal promoter would be. And so we get more transcription as a result. So the consensus sequence, the nucleotides that are present in that promoter are really important for the processes that follow. Uh, and really what's happening here is that DNA is bringing in the proteins. So let's talk for a minute about the proteins. So these minus 10, minus 35 regions, uh, they are binding to a protein that we call sigma factor or sigma 70. Um, so sigma 70 is um, one flavor of sigma. We'll, we're going to talk in a minute about uh, different flavors. So there are um, sigma 70, sigma 38, sigma 54. There are multiple different variants of sigma, but sigma 70 is the most common. And so um, we, we, when we're talking about sigma factors, we're usually referring to sigma 70. So sigma 70 is going to interact with the minus 10 region and the minus 35 region. So different portions of this protein are gonna reach out and grab the minus 10 and minus 35. And so they're gonna interact using the major groove, which you might be able to surmise because there's a specific sequence that the sigma factor is reaching for. And remember, if we're looking for a specific sequence, the major groove is better because it's open, there's more space for the proteins to get in and kind of feel what the sequence is. Uh, we'll come back to this UP element um, when we talk about regulation. Um, what's, what I can tell you now is that the UP element uh, is not necessarily, well, it's not required. Um, the presence of the UP element uh, adds to some regulation that can happen in, in this process. And what, what, what's actually happening is the, the RNA polymerase is interacting directly with the UP element. So the presence of the UP element encourages the binding of the RNA polymerase. But right now I wanna focus your attention on sigma 70 uh, and, and some of the other sigma factors.
So sigma 70 is important because it has two jobs. Well, yeah, two jobs. Um, and the other one is a little bit, I don't know, loose. So the first job is that sigma 70 is binding to the promoter and it's bringing RNA polymerase in. The second job is that that sigma 70 is involved in separating the strands. So it's taking us from a closed complex to an open complex. So those are the two main jobs. The third job is that the sigma has to get out of the way in order for the promoter to, to be cleared. And so the last step of initiation is that we have to move that polymerase off of the promoter. So promoter clearance does involve sigma 70, but it's really more of like a, getting it out of the way, which is why it's like two and a half instead of three. So we already talked a little bit about how sigma 70 is going to come in and bind to a sequence based on the similarity uh, uh, or the, 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 the closeness of the match between the sequence and the consensus. Now I want to focus your attention on this step. So how we go from a closed complex to an open complex in bacteria. So the, the minus 10 element, as you noticed from the previous slides, is AT rich. So it's T, A, T, A, A. There's, there's lots of A's and T's there. And so what that means is that separation of those A's and T's is, is more energetically favorable than it would be if there were G's and C's. So the A's and T's don't bind quite as well as the G's and C's do. Um, they're, they're more loosely associated. And so that's a good thing in terms of separating the strands. So what happens with the sigma is the sigma will come in and stick to the sequence and, and stochastically, so just randomly, some of those nitrogenous bases will flip out and they'll actually enter into the sigma, the sigma factor itself. So they're flipping out and the sigma factor is holding them in place once they flipped out. So not only are there weak interactions between the A's and T's, but we're grabbing some of that, those nitrogenous bases and pulling them out so that it can't come back together. And so sigma factor is directly interacting with the DNA and forcing it to melt, forcing those strands to separate. And so binding of sigma 70 is, 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 is bringing in the RNA polymerase. Once the RNA polymerase is present, it's then interacting with the minus 10 and the minus 35 element in a way that helps to stretch or pull those strands apart from one another. And it takes us from this closed complex to an open complex. All right. So while we're here, um, I just want to talk briefly about the alternatives to sigma 70. So sigma 70 is what we talked about on the last slide. That's what's melting the strand and actually flipping those nitrogenous bases out of place. I just want to highlight that that's not the only way that this could happen. Okay, so E. coli, our bacteria of choice, right? This is our favorite bacteria when we're talking about um, uh, well, really anything in molecular biology because it's kind of our workhorse. Um, e. coli has six different sigma subunits. And so we usually talk about sigma 70, but we could also talk about sigma 38, 28, 54, 34. The important thing that is not to memorize all of these sigma factors, okay? That it's, I, I, I'm not gonna ask you what sigma 32 is involved in on the exam or what the consensus sequence for sigma 32 is. What I want to do is, is highlight to you that there are, there are different sigma factors and, and make the point that they separate the strands in different ways. So they all have the same job that they're recruiting polymerase to a particular place, and they all have the same job that they're separating strands, but they're not all using the same mechanism to accomplish that goal. And so here's one example that I've cherry picked on the side. So sigma 54 is binding to a promoter, recruiting RNA polymerase, and then it has this triple A protein that's binding to an upstream activating sequence here. So we've got a UAS and a triple A protein bound here. This is going to use ATP in association with this IHF protein to force that DNA to separate the strands. And so we've got um, 
one mechanism that's like physically reaching in kind of like a fork and grabbing the nitrogenous bases out of the DNA. And we've got another mechanism that's working kind of like a plunger to push the DNA and separate the strands. So multiple sigma factors, they have different jobs within a bacterial cell. Uh, and that's nice, right? Because not all of the RNAs are gonna have the same jobs. So having different proteins that can activate transcription at different levels you, using different mechanisms, uh, it seems like a, I don't know, parsimonious or a nice, uh, simple way to think about this. Um, multiple sigma factors, different mechanisms to accomplish the same goals. All right. So if we're coming to the end of initiation, which we are, even though this has been a long video, uh, if we're coming to the end of initiation, we need to think about that, that promoter clearance. So this last step. Okay, so initiation, um, we're, we're recruiting the polymerase, that's step one. We're opening the complex, that's step two. The last thing we have to do is clear the, the, um, the polymerase off the promoter. It needs to move away. And so what happens is polymerases, both in bacteria and in eukaryotes, are um, kind of anchored in place. So the sigma factors uh, and, and the transcription factors, their job is to bring the polymerase in to recruit it to that particular location. And so they kind of are pulling in and grabbing and keeping it stuck. And so it's actually a pretty big deal to, uh, to move off of that promoter, right? So to clear the promoter is actually challenging because the whole purpose is to, to grab proteins and stick them in place. So what happens is, it, both in bacteria and in eukaryotes, there's a process called abortive initiation. And so what's, what's occurring here is the polymerase is kind of starting, it's bringing a couple of nucleotides in, and then it's, it's failing the process and going back to where it was. It's starting again, failing the process and going back to where it was. So there are multiple aborted transcripts. This will cycle back through multiple times and will form little pieces of RNA that get spit out and, and, and the process will begin again. So part of what's going on here is, is there are mistakes, right? The, this polymerase is error prone, it's making mistakes, it's not bringing the right uh, RNTPs in, and so it's spitting out uh, mistakes. And, 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 and that's all fine. The other thing that's happening is it's trying to build up uh, and, and here I'm going to anthropomorphize a, a little bit because we don't actually know exactly what this looks like, but I have a way that it makes sense in my head. So uh, uh, I'm going to anthropomorphize, just know that this is um, a best guess, not, it's not perfect. But what's happening is we're kind of building up some energy. Okay, if, if the, the proteins are bound and they're stuck, we've got to get some energy to get past that. And so, so what we have been able to figure out is that there's actually some, some, some scrunching of the DNA. So the polymerase is pulling the DNA, it's scrunching up, whoops, it's scrunching up the DNA in here. And, and the thought is that it's using that energy, right? It's pulling the DNA in and using that energy as kind of like a spring to push the polymerase off. And so what has to happen is we have to make an RNA that is with reasonably high fidelity, 10, 10 nucleotides long. So we want something that's that, well, reasonably high fidelity, eight nucleotides long. Once 10 nucleotides have been surpassed, initiation is over. So, so like eight nucleotides that are all stuck together, at that point we would have a transcription bubble. Remember I said there are eight nucleotides of contact between the template and the RNA. So we would have a nice transcription bubble. There would be lots of, of things kind of holding it all into place and pushing this thing uh, forward, right? Using the kinetic energy of, of scrunching that DNA up, it would push the polymerase forward. And that energy is used to propel the sigma 70 out of the RNA polymerase. And so what we end up with is a polymerase that has a transcript that's longer than 10 nucleotides. And it is, um, uh, it's, it's got an open complex of DNA inside of it, and it's humming along, moving in the downstream direction. 
So in the next video, we'll talk about elongation and termination. If you have not gotten up yet, I highly recommend getting up and doing something. Go, go walk someplace, walk around your house, um, walk around the yard. Um, come back to this in a little bit. Okay.